Ну что, добрый вечер, дорогие друзья, и добро пожаловать на отделение теоретической прикладной. Мы открываем осенний цикл колоколевого отделения, в котором, как и в прошлом году, будет три доклада. И я с огромным удовольствием передаю слово Павлу Валерьевичу Брешкову, который представит нашего первого докладчика Нирина Дайбов. Я, в свою очередь, с огромным удовольствием представляю Мирею, человека, который нас много учил, учил баскому языку в свое время. Мирея вообще дружит с Атиплом многие годы, и не только с Атиплом, но и с Атиплянами. Значит, многие выпускники либо учились у Нарии Баскому, либо сотрудничали с Нарией. Кроме того, что... Значит, вот э, когда-то преподавал у нас баский язык, э, мы имели счастье впоследствии уже учиться по работам Нереи э, русскому языку и формальным подходом к русскому языку, и формальным подходом к русской диахронии. Э, Нереина э, диссертация была посвящена Подержу диахроническому подходу к русскому падежу и в основном была связана с эволюцией инструменталиса. После этого у Нарей было много работ на разные темы, связанные с историческим синтаксисом на русском материале. Нарей, кроме русского, знает огромное число языков, в том числе чешский, насколько я знаю, из славянских. Вот. Ну и, конечно баски, испанские, всякие разные другие языки. Но сегодня значит, доклад будет посвящен русскому и, значит, в частности, истории значит, эволюции нулевых подлежащих и связанным, связанным с этим вопросом. Вот, поэтому, пожалуйста, приветствуем Нарея Мадарьевна. Спасибо большое, во-первых, вот, э, что меня приглашаете, <laughs> уже не первый раз. Э, с вашим позволением я буду читать э, лекцию, этот доклад буду читать на, на английском языке, мне просто удобнее. Вот, если вы хотите, потом можете задавать вопросы, на каком языке хотите, мне все равно. Как я отвечу, это постоятельство посмотрю на, рус, на русском или на английском. Но читать я буду на английском, мне так терминология более э, близка на английском языке. Так что, если никто не возражает, вот так и, так и будет. Uh, so uh, let's start with the with the presentation. As uh, Pasha already said, uh, it's called evaluating synchronic uh, explanation, um, explanations by means of diachrony, and it's based on material of uh, or, um, the nature of not subject uh, in uh, in the history of Russian. So uh, first, uh, you have the index of the presentation. Uh, I will say something about the goals of the presentation, then I will say something about referential of subjects in modern Russian, then referential of subjects in old Russian, by compared with uh, modern Russian, and finally I will briefly um, describe the change from one stage into another and some implications for the analysis of the nature of referential of subjects. So the goal uh, you have it there is to show in a practical way how diachronic data can help us decide between potential synchronic explanations. Uh, so uh, specifically in this talk I will um, evaluate the available hypothesis about the nature of referential subjects and try to decide between them with the help of diachronic data from the history of Russian, well, prodrop or whatever you want to call it, no subject. So <clears throat> basically uh, it would be the following. So uh, we have two options in the literature, in the formal uh, literature about the nature of null subjects, of, of referential null subjects. And one hypothesis says that they have a pronominal nature. And the second one says that um, uh, in fact null subjects are not pronominals have nothing to do with pronouns, but are uh, directly the rich inflectional uh, inflection that we find in the in T or in the for, ver verbal forms in uh, consistent non-subject languages. 
So the proposal here is that the change in infinitive of sub subjects in Russian, which is related to the loss of consistent, uh, the consistent subject uh, character uh, of, of Russian, uh, gives us as a result that the pronominal nature of referential of subject is the only alternative to understand uh, these, uh, these elements. So let's see, in first, uh, we'll say something on referential of subjects in modern Russian. Uh, first of all, I will uh, briefly describe the two languages, the two types of languages that I will take into account here. The first one is consistent null subject languages, uh, like uh, Italian, Spanish, and as we will see, uh, Russian. Uh, the main characteristic uh, feature of these languages uh, is that uh, non-emphatic and non-stressed pronoun subjects, let's call them weak pronoun subjects, must be dropped. Uh, it is not that they are available or not available, as in Russian, modern Russian, but they must be dropped. So uh, in Spanish, uh, if you s want to say something like, how do you want the soup? I want it hot. Uh, you cannot say, como tu quieres la sopa? You must drop the, the subject. You must say, como quieres la sopa? And the answer, the correspondingly, la quiero caliente, without the subject. And uh, if we are talking about Juan or some, someone else, uh, and we both, the hearer and the speaker, know that it's something about Juan, uh, at some point we say, he came and took the computer away. We need, again, to drop the subject. We cannot say, él vino y se llevó el ordenador. We say, vino y se llevó el ordenador. So that's for consistent on subject languages. Uh, the second type of languages we are going to take into account here are partial non subject languages. So, well, there are quite a few in, in, in the in, uh, among the languages of the world, and we can characterize them, well, they, they have many properties, uh, as we will see. Uh, so there are as many um, patterns of partial non subject languages as Partial subject, not subject languages are in the world, so they have many different properties. But uh, in, in, in general, we can say about them that the baseline realization in these languages, the baseline realization of subjects is overt, but that uh, they can be dropped under certain conditions. So in general, in Russian, we will say, Где ты любишь гулять? Я люблю гулять в парке. Он пришел и забрал компьютер. Computer. Uh, but sometimes we can drop uh, subjects uh, under certain things, even or not only subjects, but all other elements in the in this in the sentence. So we can say, "Ты дашь мне, пожалуйста, посмотреть?" You can say, "Дашь, пожалуйста, посмотреть?" And it's uh, it's a possibility. And in some cases, it uh, also seems that you need to drop the subject, like in four. Он сказал, что придет вовремя. But we will see that these, uh, these null elements are a little different. We will see that embedded uh, null subjects are not the same as in broad uh, clauses. Uh, so um, that is why it seems that we need to drop here. In, but in principle, in partial null subject, uh, uh, sub, uh, null subject languages, the, um, the availability of uh, a null or, of, or, or the weak over pronoun is what matters. Uh, so, uh, modern Russian is a partial null language, which is uh, not to say much, unless we describe its properties more specifically. So, uh, in, in general, uh, how are null subject licensed, uh, at least uh, in formal linguistics? Uh, in the last years, uh, the, the authors are paying attention uh, to the importance of the C layer in licensing subject drop. And we will see here two, two variants of this uh, recent approach, uh, approaches in minimalism. So the first variant is Frascarelli, and she says that null subjects, subjects in, in, in consistent uh, null subject languages are licensed by a null aboutness shift topic. So she calls it like aboutness shift, shift topic. We will call it, or a topic, we will call it uh, a topic, which is in C. And this a topic is nothing but what we are we were saying about Juan. So talking about Juan, vino y se llevó came and took the computer away. So it's something like that. It's it's the topic of the of the text, uh, and uh, she says that in in, in this line in general, 
Um, there is a principle, the avoid pronoun principle, which is uh, by Chomsky for other purposes. But she takes this principle and she reformulates it, uh, it in the say, in the following way. So she says uh, we need to avoid a strong pronoun whenever the a topic, the aboutness shift topic, is continuous. So if we don't introduce a new a topic. Uh, uh, we need obligatorily, we need to use uh, an old subject, like in example four, about one in the, com the computer. So she says that this principle is also uh, valid for partial non subject languages, only that in them there is also a second requirement, which is locality. So she says, for, for example, in Finnish, uh, we, uh, don't, we cannot drop. The, that's what, what, what she says. We cannot drop uh, subjects in root clauses, but we can drop them in, in, in embedded clauses. This is because the A topic, which is the subject of the matrix clause, is very near, is local with respect to the null subject that, that we have in the embedded clause. And then later on, uh, she corrects a little bit this and says that first and second person subjects in general in all languages can be dropped in a, on a here speaker basis. Um, so there are some logophoric features in C which uh, allows us to drop them. Uh, the second variant is in the same spirit, but it's a li little different, is Sigurdsson mm, 2012. Uh, he uh, studies the, what, what is called the topic drop, which is uh, also related to subject dropped. And he unifies what uh, topic drop in some German languages with Finnish uh, subject drop in the, for the third person. With this this uh, control uh, subject drop in Finnish in, the, in embedded clauses. And he says that it's, um, they are bound topics. So he doesn't say that it is something located in spec T associated to C as Frascarelli, but he says that they are already located in C. So it, it's something that you must move or match directly with C. Uh, so he says that subject can be dropped in the position spec C if it's not occupied by something else. So uh, according to him, uh, if, if, if there is something fronted, uh, something located in the position spec C, then um, dropping of the subject is not, li is not licensed. So we have 5A, speak first person singular, sometimes Icelandic, which is OK. But if we front the adverb, uh, sometimes speak I, uh, first person singular and Icelandic, it is not OK. And again, first or second person subjects are dropped on a here speaker basis. Uh, unless you have something on spec TP, which is blocking, um, uh, blocking movement, as in 5B, for example. So, uh, which will be very basic, will be very important, will be basic for, for this presentation, is the notion of obligatoriness and optionality of the null subject. So, uh, remember uh, the avoid pronoun, pr pronoun principle applied to these null subjects uh, by Frascarelli, uh, which is that uh, we need to avoid strong pronoun whenever the A topic is continuous, uh, if we don't introduce a new A topic. So this uh, is um, this is a correct uh, or maybe something that can be applied to languages with no over weak pronouns like Spanish. For, that is consistent in all sub such languages, but maybe this is not uh, relevant for languages with over uh, weak pronouns like Russian. So let us see some examples, and, and I will need at some point some help from the audience because uh, there are some some. Um, uh, intuitions on Russian, I, I couldn't find as such in the literature. I, I'm not very sure about. So let's see Spanish. And uh, let's uh, think that someone says uh, Juan is a determined person. He got a flat tire and he immediately changed it. And the second, uh, so the other speaker asks, uh, and what would you have done in his place? So what is doing the second speaker? He's uh, changing the a topic by introducing a contrastic topic. So here in Spanish, you need to have an overt pronoun. Tu cabrías hecho en su lugar, and it's the only possibility. You cannot drop here the, the subject. So it okay. It, uh, you have a contrast, contrastic topic. You have a, it renders you shift in the a topic. So you use the, the pronoun. Uh, the same situation. Juan is an undetermined person. He got a flat tire and immediately changed the wheel. 
And the second speaker asks something different. Uh, how did you know? And here we have the possibility to use or not use the pronoun in Spanish. But there is a semantic, little semantic nuance. So if I say, ¿Cómo te has enterado? It's just, okay, you are talking about Juan, but stop. Just tell me how did you know about that, and then keep on talking about Juan if you want. So the speaker doesn't, the, the person who poses the question doesn't intend to change the topic of the, of the, of the conversation. But if I say, ¿Tú cómo te has enterado? With the over pronoun there, there is something uh, different uh, in the interpretation. Uh, the, the person who says, ¿Tú cómo te has enterado? With the over pronoun is trying to maybe to change. Uh, so stop talking about Juan. Now I want to talk about you. How did you know about that? Were you there? Maybe, maybe you weren't supposed to be there and you were there or something like that. So, or I don't believe you. Tell me with all detail, how did you know about that? So this is a different, slightly different interpretation. So this is why optionality here is, op this optionality, but uh, the semantic interpretation is not exactly the same. And now let's see. Uh, so help from the audience, audience needed. Uh, so the same st statement. Ваня решительный человек. Когда у него начал спускать шина, он ее немедленно поменял. Uh, что бы ты делал на него вместе? I think it is the same as in Spanish. You need the ты uh, there. So, well, that's not a problem. And in the second case, maybe it's also the same. I don't know. Uh, когда у него начал спускать шина, он ее немедленно поменял. Откуда знаешь? А где узнал? Can you drop the subject there or not? Not... Нежелательно. So it's not, not so good. Okay. Хуже. Uh, it doesn't matter that you have the, uh, the agreement there, as in знаешь. It doesn't make things better, right? Где где узнал? Откуда знаешь? А где узнал? Не зависит от интонации, да? Не никак нельзя, да? А где узнал? Откуда знаешь? Ага. But you can't say that. That's the point. Yeah, it is it's the same as in Spanish. You don't want, maybe I think it can be the same or very, uh, very similar to Spanish, that you, want, you don't want to change topic. You ch just say, откуда знаешь? Откуда? I don't know. Well, uh, colloquial. Yeah, but it's colloquial. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not like, it. yeah, I know. In Spanish, it's not natural. And in Russian, uh, the dropping of the subject is colloquial. OK, but you can anchor the, the first and second person on the situation, right? More or less. OK. So here we have some out of the blue context uh, in Spanish. Someone says, hola, Pedro. Hi, Pedro. And the other one says, hi, Juan. And uh, if it's the second person, you cannot use the, the pronoun. It is not a matter of um, a topic, because there is no a topic, because it is out of the blue context. But again, the reference is anchored in the situation. So if you have a first second person, which are talking to each other, uh, you, we don't use the, the pronoun. You, we say, hola, Juan, ¿estás estudiando? Todavía no has cenado. We don't say, tú estás estudiando. It sounds very weird, very weird. So again, <coughs> even if we don't have an a topic or shift an a topic, if the mm, subject is anchored by logophonic features, we need to use the no subject. And uh, in Russian, I don't know. Привет, Петя. Привет, Ваня. Занимаешься? Еще не поужинал? Again, it's very colloquial, but you can say that, right? It's, it's not, it is even non colloquial. Okay, so it's the same thing. Okay. <coughs> Uh, now for embedded contexts uh, in Spanish. Uh, the same thing, it will be the same thing, but uh, again. So Pedro came and said that you had already or had dinner. 
Ha venido Pedro. Ha dicho que has cenado. Without pronouns. So, the natural thing to say is not, not using, not the first pronoun, not the second one. In the first case, it's because of identity with the atopic. And in the second case, the you, the second person, is because of the logotophoric features. And in Russian, this is a problem. This, uh, I had problems here with the data because, um, well, so, uh, let's say, пришел uh, Петя, сказал, that pronoun you can drop, that's for sure, сказал, что сделал домашнее задание. If it's the there is co-referent, it's better to drop the second one. But if there, if, uh, there is no co-reference, let's say, он сказал, что ты сделал домашнее задание, can you drop that? No, you cannot. Okay. So, uh, and the, uh, the same thing, but with, uh, so, 12, with uh, overt agreement. So, пришел Петя, сказал, что ты приготовишь ужин. Пришел Петя, сказал, что приготовишь ужин. No. So, no matter whether you have over agreement or not, you cannot drop. So, here's the difference with Spanish. It seems that uh, in this uh, case, why, why is that? I'm very happy about this. <laughs> about this. <laughs> so, uh, so this, this is why I was telling you at the beginning that something like on сказал, что придет, there we seem to have an old subject, but this is something different. It is uh, in embedded clauses. It is an old subject. Maybe you, it is an old subject because it's null. But the conditions for licensing it are different than in root clauses. And I will argue that with other people that this is an, uh, um, an instance of control. So it is good that only in, uh, no, not only third person but also the, se the second or third per person are under control. And even if we have over agreement on the verbal form in embedded clause. So uh, here are the two levels of asymmetries in licensing. No subjects in modern Russian. On the one hand, we have first, second person. On the other hand, we have third person. Uh, and then we have root clauses and embedded clauses. In root clauses, first, second person are always uh, available um, or accessed by logophorics. And in, <coughs> in embedded clauses, I put logophorics with the, with the question mark, but maybe this control uh, rather than logophorics. And with the third person, in road clauses, we have, uh, if we take Frascarelli's variant, we have con a continuous atopic. If we take Sigurdsson's variant, we have a bound topic. And in embedded clauses, we have control of some sort. Uh, so th here are more examples. Um, uh, what about 13C? Я уже думала, что не придешь. It's okay. Well, what? It's okay, but here it's not okay. Он сказал, что ты приготовишь. Okay, so <laughs> it's it's complicated. So and the other the others are also right. Uh, всем привет, уже вернулась. Всем привет, когда вернулась. It's colloquial, but it's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so third person, uh, some more examples. These 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 are from Cedric. So uh, we have uh, embedded, uh, uh, well, not embedded clauses now, root finite clauses. Uh, we said that an old subject is locally licensed by an atopic or it is about a bound topic, according to Frascali or Sigurdsson. Uh, and if we have another element raised to CP, uh, licensing is blocked. So this, this is also Cedric's idea. And he, here uh, are uh, his examples. So 14a. Я только что встретил Лену. Я только что встретил Лену. Сказала, что их отдел скоро закроют. Окей, okay, right? Uh, я только что встретил Лену. Что она делает на кухне? And you cannot, you cannot drop the subject there. Can you? No. Окей. Okay. And the same for, uh, well, because Cedric says we are fronting что, and that's why you cannot drop it. And in 14C, uh, we front the indirect, indirect, indirect object, мне, and the same effect should be, uh, um, should be there. So, я только что встретил Лену. Она мне сказала, что наш дом уже продан. Right? You cannot drop the subject. Uh, Yeah, that you, you are not fronting the, the object in that case, so there's no problem, right? Yeah, so you are not fronting the object, so there's no problem. 
the problem is what you try to front something, right? Some что uh, or мне or whatever. If you put мне in its place, сказала мне, there's no problem, right? So in embedded finite clauses, according to Cedric again, uh, no subjects are uh, licensed under obligatory control. Uh, it is not new. It has been proposed for other partial no subject languages, for Brazilian Portuguese in Nunes, and for Hebrew in Landau. Uh, well, in different flavors. Some say that uh, it is obligatory control with movement, in the case of Nunes, uh, or different uh, types of chains. For example, Cedric uh, himself uh, it doesn't talk about movement, he talks about a nominative chain. So it is uh, a chain in which the higher and copy and the lower copy must, must be at the same, the same case, which is nominative. For example, in 15a. O in CL, patamushta ustal. So the second uh, one can be dropped, as uh, we say, it's a second copy which can be deleted, uh, because uh, everything in the chain bears the same case, nominative case, but something like 15b, where the antecedent of the null subject will be not a nominative, but an accusative, and a direct object, uh, there we couldn't have the null subject. So я убедила Сашу, чтобы он пришел, and then you cannot drop the subject. And now, so uh, before going on, uh, let's uh, talk about the two different views I have already uh, mentioned at the beginning, the two different views on the nature of referential subjects. So these are the two hypotheses between which we want to choose uh, based, in, uh, based on the diachronic data of Russian. So the first hypothesis, hypothesis A, that null subjects are real pronoun subjects. Uh, it is well uh, in, in older times, in government and binding, it was called the little pro, which was a special null category in spec TP, and it was already null when it entered the derivation from the lexicon, but uh, now we won't talk about this small pro because it is not compatible with minimalism, because nulls cannot be R5 features. Five features on T are uninterpretable, so co pro wouldn't be interpretable, and we know it is. Right, so uh, later on, uh, other uh, theories or hypotheses have been put forward in, the, in this uh, view that uh, polynomials, and uh, we will adopt Holman and Roberts, that no subjects are deleted weak pronouns. So are they weak pronouns, like in, in Russian, but they are deleted. So they have a set of specified five features. They have gender, number, and everything, like every pronoun. They function as a weak over pronoun. They are located in spec TP, and they can be deleted at PF together with the five set, just as copies are. So uh, these are the, the, their properties within this hypothesis. And null topics are more or less the same thing, but uh, they have no, the, the five features have no value by themselves. They get a value from, from C. For example, this speaker, speaker here, a uh, lower four feature. Uh, the second hypothesis is that null subjects are something else. And uh, it's basically Barbosa for consistent uh, null subject languages. So she says that in these languages, there is no null category. There is no, uh, nothing in spec TP. And it is the five features on T itself that are interpretable and expressed as a verbal affix. So the verbal, the inflection on the verb itself is what is doing the work of uh, pronoun. Uh, so Barbosa also was asks herself on how to satisfy the EPP, because we are supposed to have something in that position. And if she says that we don't have anything, well, she says, Perhaps uh, this rich morphology contains incorporated subjects, uh, subject pronouns, and is sufficient to, su to satisfy it. What we know from the development of um, inflection in many languages that they are all their pronouns which become uh, inc incorporated into the, into the verb and begin inflection uh, in the end. But, uh, well, saying that this is the reason why the EPP is satisfied is a little less stipulation. But in, in, in any case, these are the two hypotheses we are going to, to evaluate. So uh, we have already talked about null subjects in general, uh, in, in no consistent subject languages, Spanish, in partial null subject languages with the help of, of the data from Russian. And uh, now let's see something about referential null subjects in all Russian. So 
let's start with finite contexts. And then we will uh, an analyze also, we will talk about non-finite contexts, but let's start with f uh, fin finite contexts. So, uh, all Russian is usually acknowledged to be, to have been, a consistent non-subject language. Um, what do you mean with this in this talk, for example, for, for me? What is that? If uh, all Russian is like Spanish, then no subjects were compulsory in non-phatic, non-discourse-related contexts. And the about pronoun principle uh, had to be uh, valid in, that, uh, in this language. So for me, in all Russian, uh, the non subject was function like a weak, weak pronoun, as in Spanish. And uh, when we had overt or struck pronouns, they were emphatic. So let's see two examples. Uh, there are many of them, but. So 17a, Pashto, Idishi Apiat, Paimal, Yesif Sudan. What did you come again? You have already picked the tax. So it is, in Spanish, I will say it the same way. I couldn't use an uh, overcome here because it's, uh, it's anchored in the situation, because it is the, the, the hearer, the second person. Uh, so uh, regardless of the, the presence of the either she, which is agreement, and yesi, which is also agreement in Spanish, we also have agreement. Um, and if we have uh, an overt pronoun, let's see 17b, wish she would yes yesi hakel. See, this is what you, but not me, wanted. And you have there the context. So uh, this, uh, this sentence is pronounced by uh, Yeropulk uh, in the following uh, moment. So Zvenilt wants to avenge his son, King Alek, and convinces Yeropulk, which, uh, who was Alek's brother, brother, to conquer Alek's lands. So Yeropulk and Zvenilt, uh, Zvenilt attack the city. And in the meanwhile, nobody notices that Alek falls from the overcrowded Doe Bridge and dies. So Jeropol takes the city and looks for his brother, and then he finds Alek's body, body and Jeropol says this. This is what you wanted, but not me wanted. Blaming Svenil for his world. And it will do the same thing uh, in, in Spanish. Well, if I needed to say something, this, 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 this sentence in this situation. So. Uh, in principle, uh, for first and second person, modern Russian and old Russian, both stages seem similar, but try to front an element, which it, this was the difference between Spanish and modern Russian. And uh, let us see how, what happens with, with old Russian. So the situation is that one of the wise men said in old Russian, Knyaze, kon yivo je ljubishi i jezdishi na njem. Uh, we don't have the, the over subject there, and this is what I would say also in Spanish. Same thing, without the, the, the subject, because it's second person, uh, and it's not emphatic. Uh, in fact, what we are doing here is fronting the direct object, con yivo. So let's see what happens in, 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 in Russian. Князь, ти его коня любишь, ездишь на нем. Can you drop the subject there? No. Right? Uh, the subject uh, here, I, I suppose, is coin. Coin that is loved by you. Uh, uh, a horse that you are, that you love and uh, ride. Uh, your uh, pronoun is um, uh, is like modern Katori. Uh, but in any case, it is the object. It is it is uh, accusative. Well, maybe it, it, can, it can be right. Yes, but here, here it's a relative clause. It here is a relativizer in the old Russian. Yeah. Yes, but uh, but it's the it's the it's the horse you you love, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah, and you are dropping the subject. Can you drop the subject in the second case? Uh, in the second case. In in uh, modern uh, Russian. I think yes. For how how would you say that? Uh, yes. Uh, no, but that's not what they say in Russian. In old Russian, that's not the same thing. Yes, 
человека нет, боль которого не Well, I could, I could check that, but uh, I think, uh, well, no. I don't remember whether the coin is uh, also the, uh, is, it is an accusative or a uh, nominative, I don't, I can't remember, right? No, no, but it is not a, like, it's a presentation like what coin которого ты любишь. I don't think so. I will check it on, but then, no, I don't think so. I, didn't, I don't think that, that they, they had that in mind. Mm -mm. Yes, this, the, the subject is second person. So. Yeah. So, well, I don't know. Uh, I will check on the. I will check the interpretation again, but uh, I think uh, it doesn't matter because uh, in, in, in Katori also inspects CP. So. Yeah, it's it's the same thing. So it, you are fronting something there, and in if you try to front some, front something in modern Russian, you cannot drop the subject. That's the important thing, right? Yeah. Right. Well. I will see. So uh, in old Russian, as in Spanish, uh, any fronted C element doesn't intervene for an old subject to be licensed. If we have the, the needed the logophoric features, or if we wouldn't change the uh, topic. But in modern Russian, if we front a topicalized uh, or a contrastive element or, some, or focus or something, uh, then you, you cannot use the, the non subject, right? That, that's the difference. In, in third person, the difference is uh, even uh, more, um, it is bigger. So uh, let's see this uh, example with, uh, we have, um, we will see that we have an atopic, aboutness shape topic, which is repeated along the text. And every time this uh, person is referred to, the, um, the subject is dropped. Even if there appear some other uh, characters or, per or people in the text, we are talking about the same person all the time, so the, 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 the pronoun is dropped every, every time. It's the same as in Spanish. So, той же весне женись я князь Мстислав на Викорде. This is Мстислав will be the atopic. И потом возваша и растопцы к себе и до растов с дружиной своею и сын оставив Новый городе. So all the time eh, we are talking about the same eh, person. И при Ростову, и в то время умер Беша Михалко. He, here's another character, but it, it is like, well, uh, I said it. And now I keep uh, talking about Мстислав. И пойдет ростовцы с узбальцы к Владимиру. Right? So this is the same thing as we have uh, seen for talking about Juan, this and this one. So we need to drop the subject. And uh, here a little comparison between old Russian, Spanish, and modern Russian. So here the contextual antecedent is Jesus, which was mentioned quite far away, five, uh, 15 lines before. Uh, but this is the topic of the, of the text. So uh, something like Pavili, uh, so we're talking about Jesus, and, and at some point the, the chronist says, Pavili iti v gori gilifonskoy, it tuje javise im. And you, uh, so he's dropping the subject in the, same, in the first case and in the second case. The same in Spanish. You, you would see, if you are talking about Jesus, you cannot put the L, the overpronoun there. Les ordenó ir al monte de los olivos y allí se les apareció. And finally, in, in Russian, in the second conjoint, you can drop the subject. Why? Because you need to put it in the first one, right? So, un prikazal in bajik mas lichinu guri tamo ni vilcia in. So here, uh, you can see the difference between on the one case, uh, old Russian Spanish, which are more or less the same, and then modern Russian for the third person. Um, and finally, about over pronominal subjects in contrastive in or emphatic contexts. So in, in old Russian, as in Spanish, they are usually uh, very often uh, used in, in clear contrastive contexts, not always, but uh, often followed by vocabulary particles like torre, uje, boi. And you have an in Spanish, a Spanish example. Uh, Juan told me that he will help me, but I told him not to know. So it is contrastive. You need to use the, the over pronoun. Uh, the same thing for Russian. Rich is a Vladimir Chivoradi, Jenny Radizia. 
Он же речи ему, он, this is another person, this is, the, this is not Vladimir, this is the philosopher, the one um, who is being asked by Vladimir. Mm -hmm. So он же, the philosopher, told him, Vladimir, that because of this. С его ради, понеже сперва, род человеческий же нес греши, and so on. Right? This is a contrastic context, so you use the over pronoun. So summarizing so far. This is nothing new. Uh, in all Russian, which is a knowledge usually to be a consistent um, null subject language, null subjects are licensed by any topic. And another C feature must force the, uh, the, 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 the use of a strong pronoun, be it focus or contra contrastivity or something. And uh, the dilated pronoun, or in Barbosa's view, the v 2 movement, rich morphology satisfies the EPP of the T. So we have said that, um, uh, well, it, I, I didn't say it very in detail, but uh, if we say that V2T movement rich morphology satisfies the EPP of T, we are assuming that all Russian had V2T movement, right? Uh, whereas we know that in modern Russian, we don't have V2T movement for independent regions. Uh, well, That's why Bailey and Gribanova said, mm, Katya doesn't agree. <laughs> so, uh, and this is the reason, usually, uh, at least from the diachronic point of view, how, why uh, uh, the motivation for the weak pronouns to be uh, used uh, in, in the history of Russian, why did they emerge? Did, did they emerge? Uh, because we needed something to satisfy the EPP. We will see that this is not the case, but uh, this is the classical uh, explanation for this. So, uh, and remember also that in modern Russian, in matrix clauses, first and second person are licensed by logophoric, third person, uh, if it locally matches a feature in C or is locally bound by an atopic, and in the clauses, licensed under control. So, it's a different situation from old Russian. Now, let's turn to this, is, this was for finite clauses. Now, let's see. Uh, how do null subjects behave in non-finite clauses, which is uh, what I wanted to do in this talk, to relate null subjects in non-finite clauses and in finite clauses, right? Uh, usually people uh, study null subjects in finite clauses and then infinitives on the, uh, separately. But in, in fact, in finite clauses, in non-finite clauses, we, have, or we can suspect that we have the same type of null, of, of null subjects. Um, So um, let's start with old Russian. Let's start with early Slavic in, in general. It preserved the Indo-European uh, so-called agreeing constructions, in the case of Slavic dative constructions, which were analyzed in a unified way by, by, by Anderson mainly. Uh, these are two types of constructions. So the first one is a dative subject plus an infinitive, which could be used for completives and for post clauses. Of course, but for completives, we, they also use uh, the da, da, be, and all those things. But there, is, there was the possibility to use an infinitive clause with a dative subject for completives and for post clauses. And then for other circumstantials, uh, they have uh, alongside with uh, different complementizers uh, when uh, um, meaning temporal relations and local relations and everything, they had also the possibility to use an absolute, absolute construction, which was uh, an, an MP plus a participle in dative, uh, dative case. So these are for two examples. These are for all church Slavonic, but in, in old Russian, they, they, we can't find them too. So uh, the first uh, example is of a com completive um, infinitive clause with a dative subject. So So the Sadducees who said that there is no resurrection came to him. So said that there is no resurrection, and that's expressed with an infinitive clause with a dative subject. And the second one, mnogu sostu narodu i ne možete mu čevo jesti, Isusu glagola. So being a lot of people there and having nothing to eat, and this is uh, circumstantial, and it is expressed with uh, an absolute dative construction. So we, uh, are, uh, we will take into account here the first type of constructions, the construction dative subject plus infinitive. As we all know, it was preserved in the Russian language, at least partially. So in rote infinitive sentences, 
uh, both in Old Russian and in Modern Russian, we do have uh, this construction. Что мне делать, for example. Um, in embedded infinitive sentences, it, this construction existed only in Old Russian uh, in a very general way, in a very uh, extended way. And in Modern Russian, in principle, it disappeared. But there are some uses uh, where we can still um, see this construction in embedded clauses, but they are instances of adjoint embedded constructions, not complement positions. We will see uh, then some examples. So, first, for wrote infinitive clauses, these are this didn't change so much in the, in old Russian uh, into modern Russian. They have some model nuance, some future, some uh, additional semantic uh, uh, value. Вот слово в Russian брату твоему Киева не удержать and что нам делать сейчас вот they are basically very similar and in embedded infinite uh, infinitive clauses um, on the other hand in old Russian they were much more expressed than they are uh, nowadays in modern uh, in modern Russian so uh, in previous papers I argued that in old Russian they didn't display this construction didn't display syntactic control. And I related that to the idea uh, by some authors that um, that early Indo-European subordinate clauses were not real complement complemental clauses, but adjuncts. And it's also related to the traditional view that subordination in early Indo-European was not developed. So it's not that we not developed it developed. It was that it was different, right? Uh, just different. But uh, so uh, and in modern Russian. Uh, embedded infinitive clauses in complement position, at least most of them, maybe not all of them, display obligatory control as in most modern uh, Indo European languages. So, in modern Russian, a control structure would be Yehachu Paiki, where uh, there is control uh, of the subject on the embedded clause. And, um, and uh, there, this, uh, I said that there were some relictic uses or something in adjunct clauses where we still don't have control, or do, we don't have obligatory control in Russia. There, there are things like, uh, какие бумаги мне нужно собрать, I have the example later on, какие бумаги мне нужно собрать, чтобы моей жене получить визу. For example, this is a purpose clause. This is not in complement position. This is not adjunct, uh, adjunct position, and uh, the language somehow preserved the possibility to allow to ve um, license native subjects in those in those constructions, but not in things like "я хочу что-то делать." So. Um, so, uh, well, in those papers, I have much more examples. Uh, we, we will see here just three examples. Uh, so I would say that in Old Russian, uh, the subjects had the same distribution in both uh, clauses, finite clauses, in, 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 in root finite clauses, in root non-finite clauses, in embedded finite clauses, and in embedded non-finite clauses. So I have here some examples for uh, of uh, embedded fin non-finite clauses, which are which are the more uh, the, the most uh, strange maybe uh, for us from the perspective of a modern speaker. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> So <laughs> I will go <laughs> back and forth. So in our Russian, a non-finite subject could be in embedded clauses, and of course in finite clauses too. Uh, an old subject with no so first, an, an old subject with no change in the atopic and non-control, as in 24a. So Molisa Zamnya, o tichies ni zbabli no biti at siti nepriyaznyne. Pray for me, for me to be saved. So I will, I will be saved from development. And uh, here we see that the, um, the subject of the embedded clause uh, is an infinitive clause. It is a null subject, and it has a secondary predicate related, which is in the diff case. Then uh, as another type of subject we call, we call fine, uh, an overt dative pronoun. I would say that it is also a strong pronoun, as in uh, broad uh, clauses, emphatic or contrastive, and also non-controlled. So 24b. Ты со мной целовал крест, ходите нама по одиной думе объема. So we, you and me, swore that we will do, will go by the same thought, so we will do the same way. 
Uh, so here, the, sub, the subject of the infinitive clause is nama, which is a pronoun. It also has a, a BMA floating quantifier related also in data. And the uh, and antecedent here is a split antecedent, te sam noyu. Right? And it is typical, so it is impossible in obligatory control structures to have split antecedents. So this is also a di diagnostic that here there is no control, or, or at least there is no obligatory control, or syntactic control, as I would call it. Uh, then we could have any regular overdative MP subject, as in 24C, is lisha se buiki, stuku i gromu veliku, and he heard that there was a noise and a big thunder. So, here we have the whole MP, as we saw in the examples uh, from our church, Lavanik. Uh, and finally, we, we can have any known verbal predicate or floating quantifier referring to the non-finite subject, as in isvabia nu or obiema. So we can find uh, everything we want and we cannot find in, in modern Russian. So let's try. Uh, because in, this, in most of these cases, uh, in modern Russian, we will have um, obligatory control structures. And, uh, obliga and control, obligatory control, no subjects need a local, C commanding, non split antecedent, slope interpretation under ellipsis, and they have some other properties. So try to say something like 24A or 24B in modern Russian, and you can't you can't use there an infinitive clause. You need to use um, something else, a finite clause. So, molis zamnya bits is bablenum, or ya staboy pa bishal pa iti pa bishali pa iti v mieste v kino, and ya staboy, not me, me staboy, me staboy. Okay, but it's me. It is already a plural, so it it, it is included here. We don't have. Mm, we have this, so no you, right? So, just a boy, split antecedents, we cannot uh, license a null subject in infinitive clause. So, but remember what Cedric said about embedded finite clauses. They, he said that they are also obligatory control in, in modern Russian. So, we have here uh, that non finite embedded clauses, at least some, and non finite in, and finite embedded clauses, at least some, are both control structures. Uh, so, well, I, uh, there are some studies, uh, some, some statistics by Cla Claudi and Pinelli and Luraghi, um, where they show that uh, the extension of the new complementizer Sto and Sto be replacing the Andave was by the 14th, 15th century. And it was parallel to the quick uh, extension of overt weak pronouns in finite embedded contexts. And they said that it was faster than in broad sentences. And we compare it with the non finite um, clauses. And uh, we, say, we see that the last instances, instances of overdated subjects in embedded contexts are uh, from the 16th, 17th centuries in literary texts. So, well, maybe I will skip this. Well, uh, so one uh, way in, uh, so control can be understood in multiple ways. So I will present here just one of the ways in which we can understand it. It is the movement theory of control. You can believe it or not. Many people don't believe that there is a movement in control. Some people just say that there is some chain with uh, several copies, or may maybe some people believe in the big pro you have there, here. So I don't really care which uh, theory you like uh, most. Uh, the important thing here, well, I will present this one because it's the one I used uh, uh, in my papers, and that's it. So, uh, in this, under this uh, theory, the movement theory of control, the non finite subject races into the matrix close for nominative case. So, uh, you can see this t, which is trace, left by the movement of the subject into the matrix close. And that's why we form this nominative chain. And nominative is also reflected on any subordinate uh, floating quantifiers that can uh, floating quantifier that can appear. So Ivan Hochit Pachida Moya Yin, but not Ivan Hochit Pachida Moya Namu. Right? But if we have agents, we as we have said, we preserve the old pattern. And in a purpose clause like in twenty seven B, Ivan Zajirjalsa Stubi Paikida Moyat Namu, but not Ajin. Right? And this example is Ivan Sprasil, Kaki Bumagi Munushne, to be Yvozhine, Polochek Vizu, even with the over subject, as in old Russian. 
So summarizing, subjects in old Russian and it's split in later Russian. So let's take uh, root subjects. Finite or not finite? I don't care. In the case of, of old Russian, we had NPs, strong pronouns, no subjects. In the case of modern Russian, we have NPs, weak pronouns, and no subjects. Well, more or less the same, except for this detail of the type of pronoun. Uh, in embedded uh, clauses, both, fi both, both finite and non-finite, we have uh, that in old Russian, if we believe that there was not con no control, or control was not as developed as it is today, we had NPs, strong pronouns, and no subjects in any embedded clause, no matter whether it was finite, not finite. And then we have here split. So the old pattern was preserved in uh, root, uh, in finite clauses, where we can have NPs, weak pronouns, and no subjects, and in adjoint non finite clauses of the type, какие бумаги мне нужно собрать, чтобы его жене. And on the, in other cases, we have obligatory control. We have a trace, we have a copy, we have a big pro, what you want. So now let's uh, think what could happen here. Why did things change? Uh, the first question is what was or is the source for this overt non finite dative subject? Why is that Russian? could and can license over subjects with infinitives, which is not a very common. Um, well, if you take nominalizations as infinitives, it's common. If, if, if it's not, it's not so, as, so common. So um, usually people assume Franks, who says that Russian root infinitives have a plastian features, feature, which license dative case on over subjects and related non verbal plague. So she says, like something like, что нам делать, что мне делать одному, the, the dative comes from a plus tense feature on the, um, the infinitive itself. Uh, other people say, what Bailin, for example, that uh, the five features are inherited from C, in broad sentences, we have the, this modal nuance that future or modal or possibility impossibility. But in any case, the, the, these five features are there. This is what interests us. So if uh, we have something like дети приняли решение прийти от ним, this is not only dative, but it's also plural. Or гулять ночью одной очень опасно. It is dative and it is feminine. So there are five features there. There are gender features and number features. Uh, so if this is true for modern Russian, then it could be also true for old Russian. But not, all, not only for root uh, clauses, but also for embedded clauses, which license a native case too. So diachronical this is a mysterious fact. Uh, why did they change? So why were these over dative subjects, uh, where did they uh, got lost in embedded contexts? So their loss couldn't be due to a change in the ability of T to license, license case in general terms, because root infinitive, infinitive license and still, still, still license native case. So there needed to be, there had to be another reason. So why should this plus tense be lost historically in embedded, uh, in embedded, I, well, it's a typo there, <laughs> embedded, well, in embedded infinitive clauses, if learners had sufficient evidence of the presence of overdated pronouns and NPs in broad infinitive context, in, in ancient, uh, ancient uh, con uh, constructions. So, this is the last part of the talk. Let's review very briefly the change in the uh, null subjects themselves and then try to relate it to the uh, change in the infinitive clauses. So briefly on the change in the null subject character of Russian. It has been uh, uh, analyzed by many authors. Not all of them um, reached the same results. Uh, that's true, not even the dates, uh, the centuries and in ones and others are different, maybe uh, because of, uh, maybe not, sure. Depending on the type, type of uh, texts they analyze, more literally or more colloquial, or maybe some of them don't take into account those distinctions. So, but basically the, the history was uh, this, I will mm, describe very briefly. 
So first, there was a change in the dense system. You know, Russian, as already uh, everyone knows, uh, all charts was uh, had a dense-based system, which uh, while all Russian has an aspect-based system with all these three tenses, tenses, and by the 14th century maybe, there was only one past form, which was the old perfect. Uh, at the time, it was the perfect, and then it became the only past form, the L participle with gender and number and uh, the present copula, personal number. But, uh, it was older, of course, but by the 14th century, there is no, no, no other tense and texts, only relics. Um, then another thing that happened is that uh, this present copula, which we're talking about here, uh, which was also the auxiliary of the past form, was lost, and it was lost at different steps. So in third person, it was completely lost by the 13th century, so very early. And about the first, second person by the 15th, 16th century, so mm, a couple or three centuries afterwards. Uh, well, there are mm, different um, accounts on why did it happen. Um, according to Jung, I will take into account Jung, uh, we had uh, uh, the loss of V to T movement. If we say that in all Russian there was V to T movement and in um, modern Russian there is no V to T movement. Uh, so it, more or less it happened at this time. At this then uh, the auxiliary couldn't raise as before and we need something to fill the position that can satisfy the EPP. And that was the reason, according to Jung, uh, for the station of, of weak pronouns. Similar um, uh, accounts on the emergence of weak over pronouns are by Meyer and Ekof of Meyer. They also said that um, the strong pronouns at the beginning were dissociated from the emphatic function and then spread. Um, in the case of the first second person, uh, just what we had as strong pronouns became weak. And in the case of the third person, um, a third person pronoun was created from the demonstrative and for, for the nominative case or the, uh, at least and it was generalized ma generalized much uh, later so this is more or less the sequence of changes May, the center is uh, vary from author to author but the sequen the sequence is more or less the same so first of all uh, the loss of the third person auxiliary and the loss of tense distinctions maybe before then the extension of the first second person weak pronoun and the loss of the two movement. Then, then little later, the loss of the first second auxiliaries. So the extension of weak pronouns precedes the loss of uh, the auxiliaries. And finally, much much later, the extension of the third person weak pronoun. So we see on the one hand that the diachronical symmetries in all subject reflect somehow the synchronic asymmetries we, we, we saw for modern Russian. So on the one hand for second person, on the other hand third person, and then root cl closes and embedded closes. Then we also must say that uh, this change uh, didn't imply phonological attrition of forms, as in other languages. Uh, no impoverishment in person, in present, future, and imperative forms, only in the past form. And uh, very importantly, no historical correlation with the loss of auxiliaries, very clearly in the third person. So the delay between the loss of the auxiliary in third person and the emergence of, of the new weak form was like some centuries of difference. And even for the first second person, not all authors uh, agree on, on this, but uh, some authors, uh, even for the first second person, said that the extension of weak pronouns precede the loss of the first second person auxiliaries. And finally, there was no creation of new strong pronouns for pers first, second person, just the uh, extension of the, uh, of the strong pronouns for, as weak. So they function as strong and weak, the same uh, forms. <coughs> so, uh, so in sum, summar summarizing, how uh, Russian stopped being a consistent on subject language. So all Russian displayed the V to T movement. Then it was lost. Auxiliary couldn't raise to T and check the APP. Uh, the first and second person pronouns were reanalyzed as also weak to satisfy the APP. And um, then uh, the verbal auxiliaries, first, second person verbal auxiliaries were lost, maybe because of redundancy of agreement. 
and uh, the third person which had lived for many centuries like uh, without a weak pronoun and without a third person auxiliary just uh, reanalyzed the demonstrative on as a third person pronoun at some point maybe because if input generalization but the third person um, developed some sem in an in independent way so um, maybe topic drop which is the possibility of a null subject associated locally to a C arose by the analysis of residual and, and uh, null subjects as null topics and then which is the thing I'm interested in in this talk is the uh, emergence of the big pro the trace or the copy the, the, the system in embedded uh, clauses but what is important is that uh, it is not the loss of agreement which triggers the loss of prodrop, as uh, some authors have proposed for other languages, also for Russian, but for, for other languages. Uh, here in Russian, the development was completely different. So the loss of obligatory null subjects precedes the loss of first person auxiliaries. And in third, third person, no over weak pronoun, as we have said, and not, no auxiliary uh, was the norm. So something like dull and that's it, was known for some centuries. Well, as it is nowadays in Czech, by the way. In Czech, you don't have, it is a consistent non subject language, and you still don't have the auxiliary for the third person. So the third person has a very different uh, pattern. Uh, so this is what I'm interested in, and change in embedded contexts. So um, by the 16th century, uh, there is a change from no control into obligatory control in infinitive causes. Well, we put it 16 or uh, the, the last instances of the overdated subjects in this construction are, are from the 16th, 17th century. So uh, it is by the time when, when the replacement of the null subjects by weak over pronouns was completed in first, second person and was in progress for the third person. So uh, I would like to relate this change. So the change from something like this, 30A, where we could have in the embedded infinitive clause anything, no subject, a pronoun, an MP with any reference, control or not, uh, into this, into something like Yaha Chuichi, where the only, with co reference, the only thing we can have is a null element here. And I will say that this, this was motivated by the change in the null subjects in general in the language in Middle Russian. So, um, so uh, in all Russian, uh, in embedded infinitive context, we had, again, null subject or overt the subjects. And in finite context, uh, null subjects or overt nominative subjects. But later, null subjects stopped be being obligatorily parsed in non emphatic context. So remember that we said for, span for Spanish that the important thing, thing is that null subjects are obligatorily parsed, are obligatorily used in those in this emphatic context. Like the null subject is the weak pronoun for, for, for Spanish-speaking people. Uh, and, um, and if you lose that obligatoriness, then uh, you lose your uh, consistent non-subject character. So Russian stopped to be being a consistent non-subject language. And uh, the learners didn't or couldn't even parse uh, non-subject in the subject gap of the infinitive embedded clauses. So this one was not available anymore because they didn't need to parse it there, as they didn't uh, infinite, uh, infinite embedded clauses, uh, root clauses, and, and uh, so what did they do? They, they started to parse the gap as the alternative null, and the alternative null, uh, a trace or a copy or big pro or whatever you want to call it, um, according to the movement theory control, it will be movement prefer over permanentization, which is a principle also in generative grammar. So, uh, as a result, the modern Russian pattern arose. Obligatory control structures in embedded infinitive clauses in complement position. So, yeah, hachu, briki, damoi, adyan. Adyan embedded infinitive clauses, purpose clauses didn't fall under obligatory control and preserve the old pattern. And the newly, well, relatively newly created finite CPs with the shto, shtobu, 
generalized as embedded clauses in complement function. And most of them also finally uh, eventually fall under control with coreference. So on Skazar to Pridyot, the same as in infinitive clauses. So the implications for the hypothesis on no subjects, which uh, everything in this talk is about, is that the diachronic data in Russian uh, support, seem to support a hypothesis A. Uh, why? First, because embedded null subjects, both finite and non-finite, were related diachronically. Uh, so we had a subject gap in these uh, structures um, competing in, at some point, competing this null subject, the all null subject competing with the other possible form to analyze the gap, which was the other null, which was the big pro trace. And finally, control emerged in both finite and non-finite contexts. So uh, what does it mean? That in consistent subject languages in the old Russian stage, the null subject couldn't be, uh, be just a uh, rich agreement, but some real element in the subject position with each, which, uh, which had its uh, five features and had k's in the case of finite context as nominative and in a finite context as dative. So it wouldn't make sense if we had for so many centuries something like dal without the auxiliary and without the subject uh, that it's rich agreement that is the pronoun, for example. Uh, so in diachronically also we see that it is not the loss of agreement that triggered the loss of ligatures in all subjects. So uh, uh, rich inflection couldn't be, couldn't be doing the work of the uh, elements in spec TP. And, and finally, this is the last slide. Uh, yeah, yes. So <laughs> on the diachronic role of the avoid pronoun principle, so uh, again, as we said before, the change from consistent into personal subject uh, language must be characterized from the point of view of the non-obligatory insertion of no, of no such, no, no, not its availability. So um, the, first, because the ability of infinity to license, to license dative case didn't change. It was maintained in root clauses and in some adjoint clauses. Uh, because no subjects were not completely lost in the language. And uh, in fact, the only thing that changed for, for learners in order to, to trigger this change, the only cue that changed was the loss of the obligatoriness of the null subject with continuous atopics, the both pronoun principle. So the only thing that changed is the thing that speakers of Spanish have that we need to put the null subject while you, modern Russians, don't need to put, you can put or not in some contexts, but you don't have the, the, the need to drop the subject. So th that's what the, the only thing that changed in, in, in the language for these purposes. So uh, it, it was a change in the uh, availability of the avoid pronoun principle. And this was precisely the cue that triggered control in embedded clauses. The, 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 the lack of a need to put obligatorily there a uh, pronoun, an old pronoun, and the possibility to parse the, the, the subject gap as something else, in this case as a trace or copy or big pro. And finally, a final conclusion is that pro drop or no subject uh, languages, it is not a homo homogeneous um, parameter or, or it is not homo homogeneous. It is the interplay of a set of different properties, interaction with other maybe sometimes independent or not so independent phenomena, such as control. So the, here are the reference. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, And now we're entering a uh, question and discussion period. So uh, will, will you take questions in English or in Russian as well? As you want. OK. If I don't understand something, I will. Вопросы на любом языке, пожалуйста. Okay. 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 Okay.
question is uh, not exactly about uh, the topic of the talk, but uh, uh, you said that uh, in Spanish uh, the pronoun subjects are obligatory. But uh, uh, are there still obligatory in the cases where, uh, uh, where, where there are different interpretations? No, no. In those cases, we, we can have got, uh, like the example here, the second reply. So in those cases where we seem to have optionality, we, in fact, do have different interpretations. That's why I think, well, not, not only me, but, oh. So you mean something like this? Uh, like 6B, right? So here, in principle, it seems optional. But we have different nuances. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, I'm not talking about this. Uh, uh, if, you know, for example, uh, uh, mm. Uh, eres estudiante. Uh, uh, here you cannot uh, you cannot put uh, two in a uh, neutral context. But uh, uh, for example, if uh, if the verbal agreement has uh, uh, two different interpretations, for example, in uh, 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 in subjunctive. Cuando recibe uh, cuando reciba uh, el noticia. Uh, it can uh, it can mean uh, uh, I or he. Yeah, but you ca you get that for the context. Mm -hmm. uh, Cuando uh, recibe la noticia, mm -hmm. you and me know who is the the. Mm -hmm. uh, so we cannot subject. put uh, the pronoun here to uh, disambiguate. No, it, no, not just to disambiguate. You get some other rhythm. So you say, uh, "Cuando yo reciba la noticia," mm -hmm. it is "Cuando yo reciba la noticia." So it's contrastive. Yeah, it's. Contrastive, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know which type of uh, emphasis are you, maybe not contrastive, but if we are talking to each other and we both know that I'm referring to myself, mm -hmm. I cannot put the cuando yo reciba la noticia, mm -hmm. because it's, it's perceived like, yeah, like emphatic or something like that. Well, so for me, for me. I think. So the, uh, the same situation as uh, uh, with your example from Russian. Uh, uh, despite the fact that uh, 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 we have ambiguity, mm -hmm. we cannot put a pronoun just to disambiguate. So there, uh, there are, uh, must be uh, something other. So for example? Uh, I don't remember exactly the, uh, the, uh, the example. But uh, uh, it's in Russian where we cannot put uh, uh, the or on in the in the past case. Mm -hmm. Just to disambiguate, it uh, doesn't seem natural. You you cannot put just to disambiguate. Yeah. Uh, in embedded contexts or something like that. Yes, yes. Yeah, like uh, on сказал что пришел. Yes, yes. Exactly. Yeah, I know. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's because it's control. But in root in root contexts, you will have the on on пришел. Otherwise, you wouldn't know who we show, right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question about um, uh, about this process in old Russian. Uh, why are you? Um, what makes you feel so sure that uh, the loss of uh, inflection was not a trigger to the expansion of pronouns? It's not me. It's not uh, my idea. Uh, no, I <laughs> no. It's not my idea. So the traditional works uh, said say something like that. Uh, because in fact, I. Um, <laughs> I, I'm working on the, on the same subject, and uh, I know that um, many tr well traditional works, for example, Zelizniak um, in his famous book uh, about uh, old uh, Novgorod dialects and Habergaev uh, and well, uh, well Meyer. Zelizniak, well, uh, uh, is uh, one of those who said that uh, mm. the weak uh, pronouns precede the loss of the so if uh, weak pronouns mm. precede loss of auxiliaries, it cannot be the other, the mm. other way. In fact, uh, he, he tells that uh, both processes go hand in hand. Uh, well, not for the third per uh, per person, no. Uh, well, for the first and second person, well, and uh, with well, um, and it's in fact it's very hard uh, to distinguish uh, which one was uh, the first and which one was the, was yeah, the yeah, second. That's, yeah, that's uh, yeah. And um, it's in fact it's 
quite uh, it is uh, quite common to uh, to think that um, just uh, the loss of um, uh, well uh, first and second copulas uh, was the trigger for the expansion of pronouns here so well it's not the only one opinion uh, which was uh, cited uh, yeah yeah as, uh, i know the no, most that, traditional that's the traditional view that in mm. many languages that the loss of agreement triggers mm. uh, the extension of pronouns. Mm. but here there's not only the delay in the with the third person it's the delay is, is mm. too huge and in second first second third person for, for example Meyer also says that maybe the extension of weak pronouns is a little before mm. than the other but oh, okay we 14th, 15th, 16th century, it's difficult to know, but uh, uh, you, can, you need to say something like Mueller, that, okay, in Russian you didn't, uh, you didn't have attrition of phonological attrition of force, uh, that's suspicious, because in French you had that, in English and all those languages, uh, and, um, and it was sufficient to uh, for, for two forms to be lost, first, second person copula, in order for all the uh, system to change and the extension of weak pronouns, because otherwise we didn't have any attrition, so the, any loss of the agreement in, in the other, so in present, in future, and in, uh, in imperative forms. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, but uh, there is uh, um, uh, an opinion that uh, in present, uh, th th that the uh, same process in present was uh, just, uh, uh, um, well, uh, it followed uh, the process uh, in the past clauses uh, just um, because, uh, uh, well, of, um, mm, uh, how to say in English, uh, the, the, uh, how to say leveling. Uh, uh, yes, um, uh, it's, it's it's kind of a leveling uh, just uh, to, to make uh, the same model with the pronoun uh, as it was in the past. Yeah, <coughs> maybe, but uh, mm -hmm. again, you have uh, other languages where, for example, in Czech you don't have uh, uh, the auxiliary. You lost the auxiliary in the third person. You don't lose the first second person, mm -hmm. and everything changes. So you could say that, well, the third person is uh, lost, the auxiliary. So it is sufficient for the language to need to have the need to reanalyze the weak, mm -hmm. the strong pronouns as weak, and no, nothing happened there. So uh, yeah. it is difficult to know. I, I agree, and it doesn't yes. it doesn't matter uh, uh, much yeah, for me uh, because okay. with that, what I need is to relate the loss of the uh, null subjects in finite context and in non-finite context, and why. Did that happen? Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So, well, in, in infinitive contexts, you don't have any agreement. You have infinitives all the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. So you don't yes. lose anything. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank you. And uh, just uh, one another question. Uh, the last one. Uh, um, did you have uh, some uh, uh, corpus uh, on which you worked uh, on uh, just uh, or just you cited the examples uh, you, from you mean other languages? The finite clauses. Clo I took it from. From, uh, uh, what were from your other sources? People. And the non finite clues, I have two papers, three, m and I, uh, I use the chronicles. Uh, okay, the, the chronicles uh, yeah. for uh, for uh, so uh, all uh, all the examples were taken from chronicles. Not not all of them, but yeah, most of them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, oh, okay. I'd like to ask about the distinction between uh, no control and obligatory control. Mm -hmm. So you said that uh, when we have uh, infinitivals in modern Russian in, in, as complements, so we uh, we have obligatory control and then we have an empty category that maybe is a pro or uh, a trace, but mm -hmm. it's something else than we had in uh, old Russian, mm -hmm. where we could have this um, subject uh, being partially controlled, uh, partially correlated. Course, sem semantically controlled, but not syntactically controlled. Okay. Yes, exactly. But uh, what would you say about uh, modern Russian uh, infinitival complements uh, with pro or mm -hmm. other empty element? Uh, that is partially or 
um, split control. Yeah, there is a third type of control, which is non-obligatory control. Yes. I want. I didn't talk about that. Okay. <laughs> but this, I, I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. It is a, a different type. So it's obligatory control, non-obligatory control, mm -hmm. and then where I say no control, so no syntactic control, yeah. uh, because in, in all Russian we don't ever have the non-obligatory control. Horstein talk about mm -hmm. that. So, so okay. I. Don't talk about that, but yeah, I know that it is, exists in, in modern Russian too. Mm -hmm. So uh, this uh, example from the old Russian, where you had two antecedents of the subject, mm -hmm. yeah. So it's um, it isn't to be understood that uh, to be understood that uh, it's non obligatory control. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. it's just n just for sure not obligatory control. Not obligatory. Yeah. But maybe, maybe, maybe non obligatory control. But when you have the antecedent within a PP, uh -huh. uh, like that, zamnya, zamnya, malis, malis, zamnya, malis zamnya, быть избавлено. Там был мы с тобой и что-то пились. Там был еще вот этот. Вот тут даже. Вот ты со мной. Here, non obligatory control. This is the first one. The first one. So here, malis zamnya. So here the antecedent is within a PP, and a, it cannot be an antecedent even in cases of non-obligatory mm -hmm. control. Okay. So. For the example 18A. Yeah, isn't the syntax somewhat different from the 18b also? It's well, it I, looks I like need to, I need to check it uh, again, but uh, it looks like it is. It says it is the yeah, yeah. The they already said that. Yeah, uh, they already yeah, said that. But, yeah, but yeah, but yeah. then uh, maybe one one would wonder if if there are more c clear uh, examples. Sorry? Sorry, say it again. One would, could wonder if there are more clear examples, or or do we have, or do or do we ha happen to come to the loss of material? No, to the he, lack of this material? example is in fact is not so relevant. Uh, I just wanted to to show that if you front something, anything, well, maybe uh, the 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 object, or even if it will be a relative clause, also the relative uh, the re relative pronoun, you. Uh, already cannot have dropped the subject in modern Russian, while you could have it dropped in old Russian. That's only the only thing I would like to show here. Oh. And here I put two question marks, and maybe I should put um, yeah. non-grammatical. Right. The top. I was wondering if the same methodology uh, could be applied to explain uh, differences in behavior of referential null subjects in other languages with... Uh, uh, but, uh, that's an interesting question. Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. And, uh, well, there's um, an idea but by Maya Dewin, this one. Um, she co-authored something with me, or is co-authoring something with me. <laughs> And she, uh, her idea is that the uh, pro drop is not a unified phenomenon. So that's why when you look at partial and subject languages, for example, consistent subject languages are more or less similar. But partial subject languages and non non subject languages are very different from each other. So her idea is that uh, there is no one parameter. There are some properties, different properties in the grammar interacting. And in each language, because of different reasons, because of different uh, diachronic developments, maybe uh, things are interacting in different ways. So we, in this, uh, for example, in this uh, paper we co-author, uh, co uh, we analyze the development of Brazilian Portuguese and Middle French and Russian, which are three personal subject languages, and developed from non-consistent uh, 
uh, for consistent on subject languages. So Brazilian Portuguese from Portuguese, Middle French from non -Fren Old French, and Middle Russian or Modern Russian from Old Russian. And we see that the development are very different. So they're more or less the same elements, but in different, uh, they, they interact in different forms. And uh, for some cases, for example, in, 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 Port in Portuguese, it is very important the development of the pronouns. Uh, it is the first, the first trigger. Then and in French, the important thing is the attrition of the forms in the morphology. And in Russian, something else. We don't know. Maybe the auxiliaries, maybe the extension of weak pronouns. It is not clear. But in, in any case, the development is very different in the three of them. So maybe it cannot be used. Well, it, it, as, it, as such, it cannot be used for other languages. I think it's not a very good answer. <laughs> it's what we have. Еще вопросы? Если нет, поблагодарим же Нире за... Нежитка, спасибо вам. И скажем, приезжайте к нам еще. А? И скажем, приезжайте к нам еще. Ну, если будет приглашать, с удовольствием. Дорогие друзья, значит, спасибо, что были с нами сегодня вечером. И приходите к нам еще. Следующий колок мы 17 октября и выступать на нем с докладом будет Джон Эслинг, один из крупнейших фонетистов современных. Тема доклада появится через несколько дней, но могу предположить, что скорее всего она будет про Нерея, дорогие друзья, мы идем на девятый этаж. Спасибо.